So the paper that I'm going to present is a paper about uh, genetic nurture and educational attainment. Uh, and this work is joint with Una Han of Yonsei University in Korea, uh, June Kim of Bryn Mawr College, and then Edward Norton of the University of Michigan. So if you think of like the, um, this con genetic nurture is basically a type of a peer effect. And there's longstanding interest within the discipline of economics in peer effects in education, right? So you can probably trace this back at least to uh, Alfred Marshall, who in his textbook in 1890 wrote about how there can be in spillovers of information or knowledge among workers. And this may make it optimal for uh, industries to locate, uh, co-locate into sort of clusters. So we can think of, um, you know, Silicon Valley as being an example of companies trying to capture and internalize that, that spillover. And then Liebenstein in 1950 wrote about bandwagon and snob effects. And so applied to education, there might be a bandwagon effect to finish high school because such a high percentage of people now do that. That's where your friends are. If you dropped out, you wouldn't have people to hang out with. So it could just be more fun to continue on with high school because your friends are doing the same thing. Maybe uh, an example of snob effects in education would be getting a PhD because on the other hand, so few people do that, that there's some sort of signal of exclusivity or unobservability or something. And then uh, the work of Chuck Mansky, and of course, uh, you can't talk about peer effects without citing Chuck Mansky. Um, he talked about many different factors, including the role of resource constraints. So there might be peer effects in higher education because exclusive universities only have so many freshman slots. And if they're admitting someone else, they're crowding out uh, yet another person. And also the role of expectations. And so it may be that each of us learned about our own potential sort of ability or how fun it would be to go to college by watching an older sibling if we have one. And so maybe what that older sibling goes on to do has spillover effects for us. So those are all theoretical possibilities. And it's almost like a classic example in econometrics of how difficult it is to accurately estimate pure effects, just notoriously difficult, something that's been written extensively by, about by Chuck Mansky and Josh Angrist and Guido Imbens and many others. And among the challenges are, first of all, how do you even know what the right peer group is, right? So maybe there are peer effects in education, but it's just really hard to predict for any given person who are the people that they're, who are their role models, for example. And as, as Mansky said, if you don't even know what the right peer group is, then estimating the peer effects is basically impossible. Another factor is that these relevant peer groups might be endogenous. So maybe friends really do inspire each other, but we also choose our friend groups um, for aspirational reasons. And there's the reflection problem that maybe your behavior affects my behavior, but the opposite is also true. So how do we get a consistent estimate of just one of those directions? And then there's also the issue of if you regress one person's behavior on the leave one out mean of the group behavior, you should have mechanically potentially creating a negative correlation because when you're looking at the, the highest Y, the person with the highest Y, you pulled the mean down. And when you look at the lowest Y, you raise the mean. Um, so just so many issues uh, and challenges in estimating peer effects. So the possible peer effect that we're particularly interested in is that of genetic nurture. So this is defined as one person uh, whom we'll call the ego, who is potentially affected by the genes of another person that we'll call the alter. So in biology, this is sometimes called indirect genetic effects. So the direct genetic effect would be me inheriting, you know, those, um, uh, those uh, alleles from my parents. And then the indirect effect would be that even the, even the alleles I do not inherit from my parents, I could potentially still be affected by based on what's going on inside the, uh, the parental household. So even though it's got this term genetic nurture, which sounds like something parents do to children, there's, it, it's not limited to biological relatives. There could be genetic nurture among friends or classmates or neighbors. And so in this type of model, rather than testing whether one person's behavior is affected by someone else's behavior, you're testing whether the uh, ego's behavior is affected by the alter's uh, g genome. Um, now, there's multiple ways, obviously, that you could measure that alters genome. It could be, um, it could be in theory, just like what, whether they have this one really risky allele, for example. But typically, what people do is they use a polygenic score. So, very grateful to James for providing all that uh, you know, useful, important background information. An index of the number of alleles associated with a specific trait uh, potentially weighted for the contribution of that allele to the the phenotype. These models tend to be very reduced form, and so the model themselves, the models themselves, may not be very informative about potential mechanism mechanisms. So we're looking in particular at um, educational attainment. That's the outcome that we're looking at, and there's a large literature on the educational attainment of siblings and how highly correlated that is. Uh, Bash Mazumder uh, has done uh, several papers on this. Uh, and his work is very similar to that of uh, sort of general consensus that the sibling correlation in educational attainment is about 0.4 to 0.6. And there's numerous possible explanations for this. Uh, this is an area that's been researched by uh, Jim Heckman, Mansky, Zvigrilikas, 
And you can sort of categorize these different explanations for why siblings tend to have similar educational attainment into the categories that Mansky outlined. So one is that there could be endogenous effects. It could be that the ego's behavior really is being affected by the alter's behavior. So one potential example of that is that older siblings, for example, are role models for younger siblings. So that becomes aspirational or the younger siblings just learn about things like here's how you fill out the FAFSA. Here's, here's the list of selective schools you should consider, things like that, or even just going to college at all. Another factor is that parents may reallocate resources within the household based on the uh, educational sort of performance of each child. Uh, this is something that uh, Jim Heckman's worked on as well as others. And then this could create either a positive or a negative correlation among siblings. So it could create a positive correlation if the parents have a preference for equity of outcomes. And so then they might redirect resources to the sort of child who's more who's struggling, get them a tutor. Um, but it could also lead to wider disparities within the household. So the parents might just want to maximize the income of the next generation or get the most bang for the buck. And so they might take resources away from a kid who's struggling to back the one who really has great potential. Another uh, pot potential sort of explanation for why siblings tend to have high high, uh, a high correlation in their educational attainment um, is correlated effects, that the siblings might have similar education because they just have similar characteristics or environments. And so one factor here would be just they're each, they're gonna have similar genomes. So if we think back to that example that James gave of two, two siblings, of course, there are these coin flips of which uh, allele they're inheriting from each parent, but there is gonna be uh, a correlation in the endowments of those two people because they have the same two biological parents. Uh, Meta-analyses estimate that the heritability of educational attainment is about 40% uh, with variation across time and countries, of course. But even setting aside genetics, there's still so many other things that are similar for the same um, uh, kids in the same litter, to borrow uh, James's analogy from before. There's maybe a parenting style that's common between the children, shared household environment, the same SES, and so on. And then the final category is that siblings might have similar educational attainments uh, because of exogenous or contextual effects. Uh, the ego's behavior may be responding to the characteristics of the altar, not the behavior of the altar, but the characteristics. And so this is where sort of genetic nurture fits in. The ego is responding not to the behavior per se of the altar, but to the altar's genome. So our research question is, is there genetic nurture within families with respect to educational attainment? And so for the methods, we're testing whether the ego's educational attainment is correlated with their siblings' polygenic score for educational attainment, controlling for their own polygenic score for educational attainment. And the reason that there's variation in those is that Mendelian randomization, those coin flips came out differently for the two siblings. So this approach, it's really sort of a simple reduced form model, but it does address two of the challenges in estimating peer effects. First of all, it's an exogenously determined peer group. They're full siblings. These are not some, you know, voluntarily chosen friends, for example. And then the second issue is that there's no reflection problem because we're looking at how behavior of the ego corresponds to the alter's genome, which was set at conception. Just to give you a preview of the findings, uh, the evidence is consistent with there being genetic nurture within families and educational attainment. It's pretty robust to using two different PGSs for educational attainment and four different measures of education. Uh, there's some evidence of nonlinearities in this genetic nurture. And in terms of mechanisms, um, now the model, of course, is not informative about mechanisms, but there's things we can do to look for suggestive evidence. It looks like there's some role of both the parents and the alter sibling. So I just sort of want to clarify that even though the alter's um, PGS is the key regressor in our model, you don't want to interpret the coefficient on that as, as like being all truly due to the alter. So this relates to uh, literature on genetic nurture and education. Uh, a recent meta-analysis of 12 studies found strong evidence of genetic nurture from parents to children. So for example, one study used an Icelandic sample and they made two different PGSs uh, one is for the non-transmitted parental alleles, so alleles associated with education that the kid did not inherit as a result of the coin flip, and a different PGS for the ones that the kid did inherit, and found that controlling for the inherited PGS, the uninherited PGS still was correlated with the educational attainment of the kid. And so it seems like there is this sort of genetic nurture within households. Uh, another example is work by Jason and his colleagues, Jason Fletcher. They use the same data we do, the ad health, and they looked at whether individuals' educational attainment is correlated with the average of their friends' polygenic score for educational attainment or their schoolmates controlling for their own. And in both cases, they find evidence of what they call social genetic effect, but it's really the same concept as genetic nurture. 
It also relates to more general literature on sibling peer effects in education that exploited things like uh, admissions thresholds for colleges or school entry policies or changes in school starting age or uh, the cost of uh, schooling. So as I mentioned, we're using as that measure of the alters uh, genome, the polygenic score for educational attainment. Um, the specific one we use is from a GWAS of 1.1 million individuals uh, done by Oak Bay et al. and Lee et al. So the resulting PGS reflects associations of more than 1,200 SNPs and explains 11 to 13% of the variance in educational attainment. So these polygenic, polygenic scores have their own strengths and weaknesses in this context. One strength is that it does have substantial explanatory power, that 11 to 13% of the outcome explained, high out-of-sample reliability, and the fact that alleles are largely immutable, although, of course, their expression can change. Uh, there's also a number of limitations. So there's an unknown degree of measurement error. So James already pointed out that the GWAS won't consider every possible allele. They're gonna disregard the ones that are relatively rare, appear less than 1% of the time. And so that's gonna introduce a degree of measurement error into the, uh, the PGS. Uh, Pietro and Kevin have a paper where they talk about other various limitations of PGSs, including limited statistical power, uh, and the fact that we should really interpret this as a noisy measure, a noisy proxy uh, for the true PGS. Another complication is that um, these GWASs are often uh, conducted with largely white samples. And so there's this issue of generalizability to what extent does this PGS only apply to the white individuals on whom the GWAS is based or can it be applied more universally? So the data that we use, which is the Ad Health, they made the decision to not even estimate the PGSs for the non-white, the non-European Americans in their sample. So we're by necessity forced to look only at a white sample. And that's, of course, a limitation, not just of this paper, but this issue of a lack of you know, non-white uh, data to um, examine the robustness of PGS is a, a sort of ongoing issue. Another challenge is that um, the frontier is always advancing. There's always another more powerful uh, GWAS coming out with potentially a more accurate PGS. So there is a new, more accurate, or I should say a larger one that's already been published based on three times as many uh, individuals, 3.3 million instead of 1.1 million. Despite that, the explanatory power hasn't tripled. It explains 12 to 16 rather than 11 to 13% of educational attainment, but that's not available to us. That new PGS isn't contained in the Ad Health, and so we're using the one based on 1.1 million. So for more information about the PGSs, I refer you to the work of Nick and Kevin and uh, so many other people in this room. So in terms of the methods, the reduced form model that we're estimating is the following. So the egos, educational attainment is Y, and we regress that on the alters polygenic score for educational attainment. The red box indicates that the parameter of interest is beta one. And then we're controlling for the ego's own PGS for educational attainment. And then we control for some other variables X. So the, the primary dependent variable that we use is years of education. That's what the PGS was constructed to predict. But we also look at an indicator variable for high school completion, college completion, and grad school completion. And as I mentioned, even though it's like a very simple reduced form model, it addresses the issue of it's got, a, it's got an exogenous peer group of full siblings, and it doesn't suffer from the reflection problem because the alters PGS was uh, determined long before the outcome. The X, uh, the, the vector X of additional regressors starts out very parsimonious, just the ego's age and years and sex. One thing that is uh, missing from this regression model is we would love to be able to control for the parents PGS both parents' PGSs, that's not contained in the ad health. So that's missing. Um, and so to some extent, that beta one may be picking up omitted variable bias, may be picking up genetic nurture, not just from the alter, but from the parents as well. And so that's why I was say, saying before, don't interpret beta one as being just due to the alter. It, we should be thinking of it as reflecting all the sort of family influences. Um, but one thing we can do is we can control for the parents' educational attainment. We don't know the PGS, but we can know the realized attainment. And so we estimate models both with and without that. And then as a robustness check, we also control for whether the ego lives with the parents, uh, the total household income, marital status, and employment status. So one uh, important thing to keep in mind when you're interpreting the sign on the coefficients is that the PGS is equal to the number of risky alleles that's associated with lower education. And so the higher a person's PGS, the lower you would expect their uh, educational attainment to be. So in this case, for example, beta two, we would expect to be negative. The fewer risky alleles you have, the higher the, um, the uh, educational attainment. But our focus is not on the ego's PGS, but on the alters, beta one. Um, 
And if beta one is negative, then that would suggest that uh, genetic nurture is creating a positive correlation between siblings. So a negative uh, coefficient on beta one would mean not only is the increased risky alleles lowering potentially the alters educational attainment, it may also be associated with lower attainment for the ego. Um, beta one, as I mentioned before, it reflects all possible mechanisms going on within the household. It could be due to role model effects of the alter. It could be due to another sibling than the one we observe, or it could be due to the parents. But all of those are of interest to us because they all represent different sort of mechanisms for genetic nurture. Our sample is limited to full siblings. Um, we don't use half siblings, for example, because there may be some degree of uh, selection bias there. And we exclude twins because like monozygotic twins would not have any variation between the alter and the ego PGS. Most people appear in the model twice, once as an ego and once as an alter. In some cases where there's like a third, ch third sibling in the data, then each person would apply uh, occur twice as an alter. We estimate the model using linear probability models and cluster the standard errors at the level of family. So the data that we use, as I mentioned, is the ad health. And it's pretty well suited for this because it is an oversample of siblings. Uh, we can identify the sibling pairs from wave one data. And then in wave four, they took uh, genetic samples uh, and did assays. Vast majority of people consented. They use that data to produce two different types of polygenic scores. Uh, one is based on a univariate GWAS of educational attainment. One is based on a multivariate M-tag. We don't have any strong prior about which of those is the better one to use. So we estimate models uh, with each one alternately. Anyway, the correlation between the two is very high, over 95%. And for ease of interpretation of the coefficients, we standardize each of the PGSs to be mean zero and standard deviation one. So the ad health starts out with over 1,200 uh, sibling pairs. Um, but then there's attrition between waves one and four. You have people declining to give the genetic sample. They only create the PGSs for the white uh, European Americans in the ad health. And so in the final estimation sample, we have 630 observations for 315 sibling pairs from 292 households. And so obviously this has implications for statistical power. So just to present some uh, results, first, just some really basic information about the correlation. Yeah. Maybe before you get to give that, just to clarify, sure. uh, pardon me if I missed this, but how do you select which sibling is the ego and which is the ego? Each of them, they each appear twice. So once is the ego, once is the alter. Um, so the correlation in years of education between siblings in the ad health is 0.44. And then the correlation between their PGSs whether it's the one based on GWAS or one based on MTAG, is basically 0.5, which is exactly what you'd expect since they share on average half their genes. The graph over there shows you um, on the x-axis, what's the ego's polygenic score for education? And then the vertical axis, what's the alter's polygenic score for education? And so while they're not like perfectly correlated, right? They're not all exactly on the 45 degree line, there is this positive correlation. So they're grouped around the 45 degree line. And then the color of the symbol relates to the ego's eventual educational attainment. And so the darker the color, the more, edu the more education the ego eventually had. And so if we want to think about this um, issue of um, genetic nurture, one thing we could do is we could take like uh, any arbitrary vertical line and just say what we're doing is we're taking one value of the ego's PGS. And if you look at then it's a low sort of uh, and there you can see that the gas is pretty dark, meaning that when your alter has few risky alleles, it can go from But if you move up to an imaginary vertical line and you look at when the alter has a lot of risky alleles, you can see that the gas goes from slightly shaded into the ego uh, has lower educational attainment. So just in that very you know, sort of casual uh, way, it does look like there is some association between the ego's educational attainment and the alters uh, PGS controlling for the ego's PGS. So just some uh, summary statistics, the average years of education in the sample are four, is 14, 92.2% uh, of graduated high school, 34% of graduated college, and 11.9% have graduated uh, with a grad degree of some kind. So this is um, some of the results from that reduced form model. So the first row is just, is the ego's own PGS for higher education associated with their educational attainment? And it should be if the PGS is constructed correctly and that it, gen that it generalizes from the GWAS to this particular sample. And so you can see that the coefficients are negative. 
when things in the ego has fewer risky alleles, they tend to have higher educational attainment. But our interest for genetic nurture is what's the association with the alters PGS. And there you can see it's also statistically significant, meaning that when, you, when your sibling has fewer risky alleles, that the ego then has higher educational attainment. And the magnitude is pretty significant. So if you, um, we'll take like column two, for example. So I should clarify, the first two columns are where the PGS is based on MTAG. The second two is where the, is where the PGS is based on GWAS. And then within those two panels, one model is estimated without parental education, one with. So we'll just take column two. Um, so the coefficient on the alters PGS is about half the magnitude of the coefficient on the ego's own PGS. So the, the magnitude of genetic nurture seems substantial compared to the direct genetic effects. Uh, the way to interpret this is that if we lowered your alters PGS by one standard deviation, that it would raise the ego's uh, educational attainment by about a quarter of a year of education. So this is uh, for the outcome years of education, what the PGS was constructed to predict. This is for the outcome, uh, did you graduate high school? And so here, actually, ego's PGS is not significantly correlated with that outcome. This is something the vast majority of people in the sample have done, graduated high school, 92.2% of them. But interestingly, the alters PGS for education in three out of four cases is still uh, significantly negatively associated with it. So take what's called four, for example, if uh, you lower your alter siblings PGS by one standard deviation, and this is for the outcome of college graduation. And now the uh, the goes own PGS is actually significantly significantly negative. Once again, same pattern where so it's substantial. So here, if you um, lowered the alters PGS by one standard deviation, it's associated with a 3.6 percentage point increase in the probability of graduating college for the ego. And here's the results for graduate school. Again, very consistent. If we lower the alters PGS by one standard deviation, it's associated with a 2.9 percentage point higher probability of, of some sort of graduate degree for the ego. So uh, in terms of robustness checks, the results are very similar for the two different kinds of PGSs. So right, the first two columns are the PGS based on MPEG, the second two are the PGS based on GWAS. They tend to be very similar. Uh, results are similar for the four measures of education with the exception that high school graduation is weaker results all around for the, for the PGSs, both ego and alters. Um, another important thing to point out is just what the um, potential consequences may be of not being able to control for the parents' PGS. And so we're back here in the years of education, and I'll just focus on the first two columns. When we don't control for parents' educational attainment, then that's the coefficient on all PGS. When we do control for parents' educational attainment, it drops the coefficient on all PGS pretty considerably. Uh, and so just to reiterate, it does seem that parents their parents are playing a role in this genetic nurture. In this case, it's being picked up by the alters PGS because that's the one uh, PGS we can observe. Another factor is that allele frequency is not uh, consistent or completely random across race, race and ethnicity. That's less of an issue here because unfortunately we're limited to a sample of whites, but just as a robustness check, we ask control for the 10 principal components for GWAS, which is something that's recommended to address this issue that doesn't end up having any, any impact really on our point estimates for alter PGS. Uh, another suggestion by, uh, in work by, for example, Kevin and Pietro, for example, is to uh, test for nonlinearities uh, in these sort of um, uh, potential relationships. So to do that, we add to the model an interaction between the alters and the egos PGSs. We do that plus add a quadratic for ego PGS. Uh, we do that plus add a quadratic for alter PGS. And there is some evidence of nonlinearities. So not so much a nonlinearity in alter PGS in three out of the four um, measures of education. 
uh, they're never statistically significant. That's that the coefficient on the square of alter PGS, uh, but one out of the four, it is significant. But what we see is that pretty consistently the interaction between ego and alter PGS is statistically significant and positive. And so that's just kind of interesting because what it's saying is when both the ego and the alter have a relatively high PGS, they both have a lot of risky alleles that the ego does better. And so what might explain that, I mean, one possibility is that there's sort of like uh, economies of scale in rearing children with similar uh, ability, for example. So maybe when parents, right, have already navigated the educational system for one student who's particularly good or particularly struggling, it's easier for them to do the same for a similarly, um, you know, primed kid. But adding these nonlinearities doesn't really have much impact on the point estimate of the coefficient on alter PGS. So we're left with this evidence that's pretty consistent of some kind of uh, genetic nurture going on within the family. And we wanted to try and dig a little deeper to find out what is the source of it or what are the mechanisms of it. So as I mentioned, parents clearly play a role because when you go from omitting their educational attainment to adding it, it drops the coefficient on alter PGS. Uh, we also use the omitted variable bias formula by Oster uh, from 2019, plugging in published correlations. And that the results of that suggest that omitting parental PGS explains no more than half of the coefficient on alter PGS. So you might wonder though, like, is this just all due to parents? Maybe all the alter is doing is, you know, soaking up like the omitted variable bias from leaving out the parent. So one thing we do to sort of investigate that is to check whether the characteristics of the alter in any way mediate or moderate the amount of genetic nurture we estimate is happening. If the alter really doesn't matter at all, then it shouldn't matter whether the alter is a boy or a girl, the alter is older or younger. And so what we do is we test for differences in genetic nurture by the alter's characteristics. And what we find is that there's greater genetic nurture when the ego is younger, but not older than the alter. And so in other words, like the, your older sibling may be influenced, more influential to you than your younger siblings. And we also find greater genetic nurture when the ego's PGS is less than the alter's PGS. So in other words, sort of a, maybe potentially a sort of high potential kid can be, you know, dragged down by having a, a sibling who's struggling. So this kind of support, the fact that the alter's characteristics seem to matter in the amount of genetic nurture that we estimate is just some suggestive evidence that maybe the alters are actually involved and it's not all due to the omitted parents. There's one other mechanism we can look at, and that's the role of parental expectations. So the ad health asks kids, would your parents be disappointed if you failed to graduate from college? And so we make that our dependent variable and regress that on the ego's own PGS and the alter's PGS. And what we find is that there's evidence of this being a mechanism for parental, uh, for genetic nurture. So when there's a lower alter PGS, meaning that your sibling is predisposed to getting more education, the ego is more likely to say, yes, my parents would be disappointed if I didn't go to college. And so it could be parental expectations are being shaped by these older sibs, and that's one mechanism for this. Uh, so overall, uh, this is suggestive evidence, but we think it does indicate it's consistent with both parents and the alter siblings being involved in the genetic nurture. So in summary, we test for one type of a peer effect, genetic nurture, within families with respect to educational attainment. It avoids the problems of endogenous peer groups and the reflection problem. And the estimated magnitudes are large. So we do find evidence consistent with genetic nurture. And a one standard deviation decrease in alter PGS is associated with the ego having additional quarter year of education, 2.3 percentage point higher probability of high school graduation, 3.6 percentage point higher probability of college graduation, and 2.7 percentage point higher probability of uh, graduate degree. The mechanisms can't be like, uh, you know, verified with a high degree of confidence, but the suggestive evidence is there for a role of the parent and the alter sibling and parental expectations. Just to reiterate some of the uh, limitations, it is an all-white sample, which is a, a common problem and a, a, an issue with um, genetic research. It's a small sample. Uh, siblings are the only peer group we examine. In theory, you could look at all different types of peer groups to test for genetic nurture. Uh, and then we don't yet have this new, more powerful PGS for educational attainment. But despite those limitations, it contributes to the literature on peer effects in education, like by Scott Carell, Bruce Sasserdote, uh, within family spillovers in education, and then the broader economic literature uh, using genetic data, which has been created by so many people in this room. Uh, so thank you very much. And uh, again, really appreciate Bosch taking the time to read this and uh, offer some comments. Very happy to be here. Thank you to the organizers for having me. So uh, before directly talking about uh, John's paper, which I really enjoyed reading, 
thought I'd take advantage of uh, the topic to kind of talk a little bit about uh, you know, why I really like uh, using sibling data. Uh, so this is a lot framed by the literature on intergenerational mobility. Uh, but I think sibling correlations in general are a bit understudied uh, in economics. And I thought I'd describe a few reasons why I think we should look at it more. First, compared to traditional intergenerational mobility studies where you say regress kid income on parent income, Sibling correlations tell us quite a bit more because we're looking at more than just one factor like parent income or education. We're essentially looking at all the factors that siblings share in common. And so it provides a broader measure of family background. Um, and I think in general, it's useful to use multiple measures of uh, mobility when thinking about studies of, of, of thinking about uh, mobility in society and, you know, different measures have different, um, um, you know, advantages and disadvantages. One in particular that I really like about looking at uh, sibling correlations is that you can decompose them into factors stemming from parents, like the intergenerational association, how much does that contribute to the sibling correlation and things like neighborhood correlations. So it nicely connects to this growing literature on place-based effects. And then I think linking with the with the you know this the research that a, a lot of you are involved in on using genetic data samples, it's often more feasible to link siblings than it is parents and kids. In fact, if you have the genetic material, even if you don't know if people are siblings, you can identify them. So that's one so there's kind of a pitch that I think we really should be taking. Uh, greater advantage of uh, sibling studies. I'm also going to mention a, a, a working paper that I have with uh, Jason and Q, who are who are in the room, where we uh, estimate sibling correlations in education uh, using the UK Biobank, and then we try to use uh, genetic information that we have uh, through polygenic scores to explain, see how much of that we could explain uh, through genetics. And through a series of exercises, I won't literally <laughs> present our paper, we argue that at most we can explain about 20% of the 0.3 roughly sibling correlation that we get due to genetics. But I think one thing that really uh, influenced my thinking on this paper of, of John's is that what we did in that paper was we had the information on the, the underlying genetic information on, I guess, the ego and the altar and the, and the sibling. And we use that using some techniques to impute the parent GPS. And we use the parent GPS as a control. And that essentially put in my mind that in some sense, these are interchangeable. So I think the, my main comment really about John's paper is almost exclusively about interpreting this. And you know, at times John is very careful and the paper is very careful to say precisely that we don't know what the coefficient reflects. But on the other hand, the paper is very much framed in the context of peer effects and citing, you know, how do siblings affect one another? So I feel like there's a little bit of a tension there. And so, you know, I think the big picture question is how much uh, does this coefficient on the altar reflect something about peers versus parents? And so, you know, people in the room can correct me in, in, in the discussion on some of these points as, you know, I'm not as uh, well versed on the genetics as many of you. But so my understanding is that the SNPs of the altar are nearly entirely inherited from one of the two parents. Right, and maybe in rare cases you have a SNP that wasn't, but you know we we can discuss that more. In, in my mind, that means that if you're you that the SNPs of the altar that are being used to create the altar PGS are all present in the parents, and again, that's how we why we were able to impute parent uh, GPS in 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 the paper with Jason. So, you know, in that sense, if they are very interchangeable at this purely, you know, uh, at, the, at the rawest form of the data in terms of SNPs, 
there's no obvious reason to start with the presumption that this is about peers and then ask how much could parents be, you know, uh, accounting for this peer effect. If we could have just as easily posed this as this is about, this is genetic nurture that's about parents and then maybe thought about how much of this is due to siblings. So maybe this is more an issue of semantics and writing, but I think it's an important point. This point about in the column two of all these results of controlling for parent education, the paper describes this as sort of saying, this tells us something about the mechanism, but parent education is gonna be correlated obviously with the parent SNPs, but if these parent SNPs are also present in the altar, you know, it's gonna lower the coefficient, but again, it's not obvious to me that tells you why it's lowering uh, the coefficient. So I, you know, I, I, again, we can discuss this more, but it's not obvious to me that's telling you that this peer effect is being lowered by the parents as opposed to the reverse. Um, there's this exercise John talked about using omitted variable formulas. And I wasn't totally sure again, you know, uh, whether this this adequately addresses, you know, so they basically say if we use these formulas, we can say that at most what we're identifying as genetic nurture, at most half of it is from parents. Um, but I think it's a somewhat coarse framework, again, based on the aggregating of PGS. And, and it's based on borrowing a, a correlation between, I believe in this Willoughby paper, the average of the two parents PGS with a child. And, and so, you know, there's a lot of aggregation going on. I'm not sure what's being lost relative to this sort of, if you have the, you know, the data in its rawest form where you might think the two are interchangeable. Um, and I had a couple of comments here about the omitted variable uh, point where, you know, we know from some of the sites, John, that you had like Pietro et al. Uh, paper that there's this bias that maybe that's applying to this uh, correlation between average parent PGS and the child. Maybe not. Maybe this is about what you'd expect. Um, but in general, I think, you know, just having a, more of a discussion about the ways in which perhaps we're still understating how much of the genetic nurture could be due to the parents, both because of, of uh, aggregated framework and maybe some bias in um, the coefficients. I thought the tests of differences by alter characteristics, the sibling core characteristics are potentially more compelling. But to me, I didn't, my reading of it was much less clear. Um, so in the first three exercises in tables 4A to 4C, I forget exactly, these are like maybe the relative ages and genders. The formal tests of whether the coefficient for the alter, say, who's older versus younger, are, are different, um, you know, the, they, they can't reject that the coefficients are the same. I mean, I think it's a partially a problem of just a small number, uh, you know, the data set small. But strictly speaking, this goes against their argument. It would show that there's no difference in the, in the alter core. Uh, uh, coefficients. In the last two exercises, they do find st you know, statistically different effects, but here I was a little bit uncomfortable because here, the, the other, whereas the first three exercises are characteristics that have nothing to do with PGS, these seem to be about PGS-related characteristics where they're essentially dividing the sam defining samples somewhat based on the PGS. And that seemed to me, a little bit more about the heterogeneity of the main effects of, of your own or your siblings' uh, PGS. So, for example, maybe genetic nurture only affects those whose genes dispose them to higher education levels and not so much about different types of siblings uh, having different uh, effects. But, you know, I would say that, uh, you know, Nevertheless, I think the evidence is very clear that this is about uh, genetic nurture. So I have some other minor comments, but um, uh, the, that's the bulk of, of what I have to say. Thank you. Let's uh, open up the floor to uh, questions.
questions. We'll have sort of 10 minute discussion, 10 minute uh, questions for each of the main uh, presentations. Uh, yeah, go on. Thank you. So uh, I have a comment. So, which is that I'm very interested in uh, education being the product of so many and that's in my opinion the product is you have people in the middle like because of high school graduates and uh, don't worry and some people do not graduate from high school as I have some people have higher education call it for your college and graduate degree I'm very fascinated by your finding which is that you look at the different differences in educational outcomes in different countries and you, you show that if you can talk about uh, education that if there is no impact uh, in terms of the author's uh, PPS on the high school graduation. Now, however, if you look at uh, the much higher education uh, outcomes, you see that author's uh, PPS has an uh, impact, which is genetic, uh, genetic neutral exists. So I'm very fascinated by this. I feel like this tells, uh, tells me that the story is that the parents are very good at preventing kids from falling off the cliff, like, you know, preventing kids become a high school dropout. However, the high end, uh, you know, there are some computation or maybe some role model which are um, uh, a very important step. So at this my comments, uh, no questions. So go ahead. Thanks. Yeah, you know, I have a just a conceptual question. At the very beginning, you wanted to avoid the simultaneous equations problem that plagues the pure effect literature, this standard simultaneity problem. But the point is that somehow the only way that genes are going to be operative, even for the siblings, is through some kind of behavior. I mean, that's the sort of gene expression that was talked about in the first you know, the formation approach. So there's a sense in which you're assuming that somehow, I'm not exactly sure what your behavioral model is, but it seems peculiar. I mean, they're not really reacting only to the genetics. I mean, <laughs> they're, not, they're not fitting their own PGS scores here. So the, the, the question then is, it is some aspect of behavior, and you didn't want to get the phenotypes into that business. So that, that worries me a little bit. It seems to me that would be uh, kind of defeating of your main objective, because you really thought, well, I can avoid the simultaneous equations problem, which would be people looking at each other's phenotypes and responding. So it's, a, I mean, I understand what your assumption is, but I'm not clear that how it manifests itself, especially in the genetic data, especially given the you know, these, these uh, characteristics only manifest through some behaviors. Yes, I mean, I think that's, yeah, very valid point. And um, so I think like really narrowly, right? Like the alters PGS, that is exogenous, right? And so, but your point is very valid that like, okay, but what is, what is that PGS? Yeah, how does it manifest itself in the other? Right. It's the ego, I mean, <laughs> it's gotta be some transmission of information, some signal passed, and that seems to me to be some phenotype uh, and some behavior, in other words. So the, the very premise that you wanted to get away from simultaneity seems to come back, right? Might come back. So I definitely agree, like, it's not, I, but I would say that it, I think it's an improvement, right? So rather than just regressing two people's behavior on each each other, to have some something determined at conception, not, I, I again, I totally agree that if this is manifesting itself. But itself. then is this just like an instrumental variable strategy that state the standard simultaneous equations model and use these polygenic scores as instruments? Is that the idea? Is that an alternative interpretation of what you're doing? Well, it's not IV. Right? It's not no, IV. it's not IV, I understand, but you yeah. could use it that way, could you not? If you thought about the, uh, these phenotypical behaviors. And... So that's that's not what we're doing? So then also wants to make no, I understand that. Doing doing it, but you could do that, right? And that's what I'm saying. I'm not saying that. <laughs> okay, somebody could do it. Really interesting set of issues. Uh, you know, important to 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 figure out these genetic nurture effects. I I am I think maybe um, the way to estimate the sibling effect in a way that's not confounded. I think this is maybe something that um, uh, that um, Bosch mentioned is if you had the parental genotypes, if you control for the parental polygenic scores, actually you mentioned this as well, control for the parental polygenic scores and then uh, and then look at the effects of own and sibling polygenic scores, um, then you could separately identify the effect of own polygenic score and sibling polygenic score. Um, I mean, in Ad Health, 
you could do that by imputing the parental genotypes and then constructing the parental polygenic score, but I think the power is going to be pretty low. So maybe that there's other data sets where that's should uh, work better. So another issue is that big issue with genetic nurture is it's not clear whether it's capturing actual genetic nurture versus population stratification. Basically, mm -hmm. just basically your sibling is correlated with social class or culture and all that from which your parents come from. So if you don't condition on the parent's genotype, then there's always this issue of uh, is that really genetic nurture or some related cultural traits that are correlated with the genome of the insect. Um, and Dan actually made the suggestion slide here. So the way to do it would be to regress uh, a little bit. <laughs> I'll say for that. Uh, to regress uh, education that I think uh, would be low on the genome score, and then on the difference between Evo and the sibling scores. This way, the, the difference purges out within population stratification. But then the interpretation of the, of the coefficient yeah. and the difference is the sum of the causal effect on the person, that individual, and the sibling during the fact, but you don't separately identify those two. Yeah, no, absolutely. No, you but at least you're yeah, isolating the random but variation. For general stratification. So, uh, yeah, if you find a significant coefficient on them, you have to remove them. Yeah. So I just wanted to mention that there's a there's a paper by uh, Sanz de Galdiano and Perskaya that uses ad health and goes through exactly the type of discussions that you you were suggesting. So try to use both of the siblings' polygenic scores to impute what the paternal pool of genotype could have been, and then try to understand how to interpret the coefficients by in exactly including both your own uh, like the uh, the ego the polygenic score and the difference between the two and kind of working through that. So I think it, they, they really think through all of the different steps and the interpretation is a tricky thing because of these direct or indirect genetic effects as uh, as you guys were mentioning. They use ad health and the EA polygenic score, but they look actually at parental behaviors. So they want to understand whether there is reinforcement or, uh, uh, or compensating behavior by the parents uh, based on the polygenic score. So I think that could be, yeah, I already did actually. <laughs> <laughs> now I just sent it to you now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. I. And can you so mechanically can you put a family fixed effect and run that regression? Because I think it would be similar to this type of discussions. Because with the family fixed effect, you capture the pool of uh, uh of someone is saying no, you can't. Hannes. Is actually the fixed effect. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So you cannot physically put the fixed effect in, right? It's possible in models with interactions that you can do it, sort of, if you believe that the sort of older sibling, the younger sibling, yeah, um, is here that you're interested in. Okay. okay. Never, Never mind. mind. <laughs> John, I have, I have a, a quick sort of interpretive question as well uh, about what you. If you feel, if you think about the contribution of an analysis like this using this type of data on the literature about spillovers or family effects, do you think the value added of, do you primarily think the value added of genetic data here is providing a different and possibly more credible way of estimating these things? Or is there something special and unique about the fact that these are genetic spillovers that you think is, is, is important or relevant? I mean, so the second point is interesting, but that's not the point I'm making. Yeah, sure. So I think I think with the first that there's lots of different ways one can investigate different hypotheses, and it's it's interesting to use different data, to see if all the results line up, and raise consensus or not. Yeah. So, um, do you raise the possibility that there's measurement error in the EGSs? Does that make it possible that the siblings apparent effect on or the alters apparent effect on the ego is actually just like another measure of the ego's genetic potential for education? So possible, right? But I mean the magnitude has to be pretty substantial. Okay, I, yeah, so maybe that's right. You could kind of want to see more of the yeah. 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 Yeah.
I, I, we're going to we're going to cut it off here. But thank you, uh, oh, James. We have like it's a quick, quick, quick. Uh, I'll, I'll follow it up. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you very much to uh, John and Posh for getting us uh, started. Um, and next, we will have uh, Pierre Andre.